so it's it's just on the time to start so we might get started and um so we're on the, the the second class out of three on this triple decker which is a introduction in a way to what are called the three higher trainings and so they're trainings that we are familiar with already um, but they're why are they called higher trainings so that the trainings ethics concentration and wisdom so they're three essentials for life we can't do anything without those uh, we need them for any success in the world uh, but actually if we can learn these skills and um, get them in the right context these are skills that can take us all the way up to complete liberation from all of our problems and all the way up to full enlightenment for the benefit of all beings so really they're the, the skills that just keep on giving of course we'll benefit immeasurably from them but so will the world and the world needs some benefit doesn't it so they're skills for genuine lasting happiness and we don't need to think about that. That's what we want, <laughs> all of us, just instinctually. But it's so elusive, isn't it? It's beyond our grasp. So um, just like we may end up being parents with no training for parenthood, or we may end up leading Dharma classes or meditations with no training for meditation, or we may be put into a job with no training for it, and we kind of expect ourselves to know how to do things but it um we don't know that's why we're still in samsara so hopefully i'll be able to give you a bit of an introduction and to enthuse you to um to develop these trainings so with last week we looked at ethics and ethics is a training to help us stop um, making our life complicated <laughs> so that we can create the best conditions for our life so that all of the good things can come to us and all of the, the merit and the good karma can ripen and we can continue our, our inner journey. And ethics is focused um, on the body. You know, it's mostly to do with how we communicate and how we physically act. And today we're going to look at concentration. So that's a lot more to do with the mind. Uh, so I have the share screen. Let me just get it up because if you remember, we have this analogy. So the tree, the person with the arms and the axe. So what on earth is this all about? So last week, ethics, embodying our ethics. So in this analogy, it's having, it's our core strength. If we want to do anything, we have to be ethically sound. We have to be comfortable in our own skin, um, not have a double standard. Uh, and it's what supports us through thick and thin, this core strength of ethics. So that even if our mind's going mental, uh, how we act and how we speak is safe. We're a safe person to be with. So concentration now this week is the two strong arms. So informed by wisdom and compassion the two strong arms uh, make sure that when we wield our wisdom the axe the the, the sword of our uh, of our wisdom cutting through ignorance that it cuts the right things <laughs> so then we have our, our sword of wisdom the axe and that cuts the root of suffering so instead of having to pick off every single leaf from the tree individually, which could be thousands, you know, like dealing with our problems one by one by one, what if we could just cut the root of suffering in one foul swoop or just a couple of strokes instead of the 84,000 delusions and dealing with each one individually? So that's why we need the wisdom. As we go through, you'll see that these three higher trainings work together. They support each other. So this week we're having a look at concentration and uh, let's <laughs> really nice quote to start with to give us some inspiration from Gallic Rinpoche. So once we begin our training and concentration, we should continue every day until we reach our goal. And if conditions are perfect, we can do this in as little as three months or so. So what he's talking about is not just ordinary concentration, but calm abiding. You know, if we if we went into boot camp, 
<laughs> retreat, we could attain calm abiding. This is something that everybody can do. It's not a religious thing. It's a, it's a, it's a state of um, concentration that is universal across all religions, disciplines, philosophies. So why on earth don't we have concentration yet? <laughs> uh, well, because we're distracted. And we have distractions that come from outside of us, from the senses, external conditions, but we also have internal distractions, doubts, worries, anxiety, all of our habitual responses and emotional baggage. So that we have very little space. We don't have space outside of us to just be calm and quiet and, and learn this skill. And we don't have space within our own mind. So um, another quote, uh, this one from Yangtze Rinpoche, usually our minds are like cities of distractions. <laughs> cities of distractions, giving rise to countless superstitions and conceptual thoughts. Calming this and focusing on virtuous objects is the basis for cultivating realizations. Without this, it's just intellectual and we will still suffer. So this is one of the main incentives for us to develop concentration, that we can voraciously read, we can understand intellectually, but it's not going to help us unless we have concentration. Because just intellectually understanding or knowing about our problems and how they arise and everything, actually, the more we know, in a way, the more unhappy we become, because not it's not just knowing, we have to be able to apply antidotes and see them through and change our mind. And for that, we need concentration. We need to actually integrate all of the teachings. So these two strong arms, what they do is they help us see things through to the end. They help us stay with our reasoning until we come to a new conclusion and can change our mind. Otherwise, we kind of get started and we fall off. We fall off the wagon how many times? So those two strong arms save us from being funniest home videos and doing ourselves a damage with our intellect, which is often what happens. We're very intellectually smart uh, and really well-read well, well -read, uh, students, studious students, incredibly smart, intelligent students can also be incredibly miserable. Why? Because we don't have those two strong arms holding it all together. And if we did, you know, if we really focused, we could accomplish something quite significant in just a few months, less than a year, less than the time COVID has been with us. So let's have a look at what concentration is. Concentration is a lot more than just focusing on something uh, because Ordinary concentration, you know, even a hitman can do that. Even a shoplifter actually has really good concentration. So what makes high, the higher training in concentration, what makes it different? So here's the definition, and I love this definition. It's a mental factor that's capable of abiding one-pointedly on an object of virtue without distraction. So it's not just the skill of being able to hold our mind, but it's what we hold our mind on <laughs> is equally important. So holding our mind on an object of virtue, something that brings long-term happiness. So it might be on love or kindness, on compassion, um, on wisdom, on developing any of those six perfections. Uh, but an object of virtue is qualified by this care and concern. It's not just a neutral thing. And we tend to think of concentration as a neutral thing, and that is ordinary concentration. So we can be very concentrated on resentment, for instance. <laughs> and no one has to say now, Miffy, bring your mind back to the anger. Don't let it, you know, wander off. We're, we're actually, uh, we've got attention capture for those things through our habits and our karmic imprints. So this concentration is being able to concentrate in whatever way we like, for however long we like, on an object of virtue without distraction.
when we have this type of concentration, the result is mental and physical pliancy, which means that mentally we're very flexible and relaxed. So that's one of the signs of having good concentration is we become more relaxed, not uptight. If we, if we develop our concentration by force and get uptight, it is unsustainable and we'll burn out. We'll, we'll blow a gasket and we won't want to, after a while, we won't want to have anything to do with it. So remember this, when we're developing this skill, we naturally become more mentally pliant, more relaxed, naturally clear, uh, able to easily discriminate between what's right, what's wrong, what to do, what not to do. And as a result, then we also have physical pliancy, which means we have less aches and pains. We don't store our tension in our neck and shoulders. We don't grind our teeth when we're asleep at night, uh, where our, our body also mirrors the state of mind. So then, of course, our immune system goes up. We, have, we live a longer life. We have uh, less illness and less aches and pains. So right there, we should be getting a bit of an incentive. Concentration is also naturally blissful. When we're in the zone, you know, when we're completely focused on something and we've achieved mastery, so we don't have to put that uh, effort into it, uh, when we have the skills developed already, then concentration is a naturally blissful state of mind. It's not a flatlining thing. It's actually uh, joyous. And uh, our high training and concentration engenders all of our good qualities. So we can uh, express our ethics. We can develop our heart. And of course, it benefits others. So the concentration has to always be um, informed by this good heart, the altruistic attitude. Now, um, I've been reading a little bit about the effects of COVID and uh, lockdowns on people. So we've we had just a very short lockdown off and on in Brisbane, in, in Melbourne, they had a couple a couple of months at least. And I know in various parts of America, there's been really extended lockdowns. So there's already been some studies about what happens. And one of them is a phenomenon called brain fog um, that's been documented now about what happens with these lockdowns. And I was thinking about this. And one of the things, of course, is that our senses, our, our um, our, our focus is continuously drawn outwards to our by our senses. So we are reliant, heavily reliant on what comes in through our eyes, our ears, what we touch, what we taste. Um, our entire focus has been outwards and dominated by our senses. So when we go into lockdown and we don't have any stimulation anymore, we can't cope. So it kind of shows how reliant we are on stimulation from our senses to keep any form of kind of awareness. Um, whereas if we'd already had this skill of concentration, lockdown is just be an utter boon. <laughs> It'd be like fantastic enforced retreat. What could be better? And be, we'd be alive and mentally alert. So the brain fog shows, the extent of brain fog that we have shows the extent of reliance that we have on stimulation from the senses. Of course, the other thing that happens too, um, why it's so difficult to lay down memories um, when we've been in lockdown is because we associate events with places where embodied people. So if we're in the same place for months and months and months on end, everything mushes in together. So our short-term memory has been deteriorating if you've been in lockdown. And that's why if you can ever get to a Dharma center physically, it's so amazing because not, not only um, do we have that stimulation from the senses, but you associate quite profound uh, inner development with a holy place and you get the benefits of being in a holy place, all the energy that comes from that. And of course, 
many of you have Zoom fatigue, if you, especially if you've had to have interminable meetings for work, for instance. Um, and that's also why we have the fatigue from that is because uh, it's a tunnel vision thing. There's nothing coming in from the senses. So we can't read people's body language very well. Uh, we can't touch them. We, we don't have the input that comes in from our from our ears and our eyes of what's around the room. It's just on the topic. And sometimes even if people have their cameras off, then it's there's not even a person there. So if you've got concentration, it's great because it means unadulterated focus. Fantastic. All the peripheries are gone. But if you've been reliant on all those peripheries, what happens is suddenly this sense of enormous effort and we get incredibly fatigued. We're not used to focusing on just one topic without any extraneous information coming in. So the, again, the amount of Zoom fatigue that we have shows how much we're reliant on those external senses. Uh, okay, so um, just before I go on, I was wondering, does anyone have any um, questions so far? Uh, just wave at me on your camera if you have and I can answer them. Otherwise, I can go on again. But um, I just wanted to give a little bit of a, a break to give you a chance if you have a question or a comment. Everyone's okay? You're all looking very serious. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, so let's have a look at then. What are the obstacles to concentration? Why haven't we already developed this skill? So I have this beautiful photograph of um, Lama Yeshi meditating up in uh, the Himalayas. This must be from Copan somewhere. And he's in the uh, seven point Virachana uh, meditation posture. So you can see it's got that incredible balance between uh, putting some effort into keeping the posture alert and straight and also um, being, you can see the focus of the meditation, but you can also see complete relaxation. So this is quite a, um, quite a feat to be able to be very focused and relaxed. We're not used to this, are we? We're only used to focusing with tension, not with relaxation. And this is why it's so difficult for us. So we've got some obstacles and we have some antidotes, <laughs> so let's have a look at them. Laziness is the first obstacle and don't get all guilty about this or judgmental. Laziness comes because we're focusing on the difficulties and not on the benefits. So um, if we remember the benefits of samadhi, of single-pointed concentration, that mental and physical pliancy, you know, like this optimal state of flourishing, really, uh, if we remember those benefits and we also understand that it's possible for us personally to develop it, our laziness will just dissolve. So why we have it is because subtle laziness is actually thinking that we can't do it. It's underestimating our potential and thinking well other people might be able to but I'm too old or I'm too busy or I'm not Tibetan it's not natural all of these things that's actually that uh, low self-esteem is a form of laziness because it disregards our potential and we have this potential so it's kind of like if we had a million dollars buried in the backyard and we're going oh I don't know I don't think I can dig properly <laughs> we wouldn't care whether we could dig properly or not. We'd just go out there and do it, wouldn't we? Because now we're focusing on what we can achieve and the benefits and we know we can. So that's a really big thing to, to not underestimate yourself. Then we have forgetfulness. So Nagarjuna likened the mind to an elephant tied by the rope of memory to the pillar of the object of meditation. So our object of meditation is a focus in the middle there, something virtuous. 
And then it's our um, memory or concentration that ties our mind. So, you know, when I sit down to meditate, <laughs> I have this sensation like I'm in the vicinity of the topic. <laughs> so I'm not thinking about something totally different. I'm in the vicinity, so my elephant is tied to the topic, but it's raging around, squishing all the vegetation, you know, in this incredibly wide circle, but it's kind of there roaming around in the topic. And eventually <laughs> it settles and stops squishing all the vegetation and the flowers and whatever and actually calms down. So that's the thing is to get closer and closer and more and more relaxed instead of being this wild, crazy elephant. <laughs> Uh, then um, how to, uh, let's see, how to overcome the forgetfulness is to just try and get a habit every day, do a little bit of practice, consistency. And um, don't go for the big, the big result. Go for the 1%, uh, you know, 1% better each day. What can you do 1% better? Just nibble away at the edges. <laughs> Maybe we can extend the elephant analogy like they say, how do you eat an elephant? You start at the toenails. <laughs> so, you know, just little bit by little bit. Don't try to do everything all at once or we'll get disheartened. So this consistency is the, the antidote to the forgetfulness. Um, then we have, it was a bit uncouth, wasn't it? How do you eat an elephant? Not very Buddhist at all, but there you go. I'm a bit of a naughty Buddhist. Um, mental wandering and depression. This is a really big one. So the mental wandering, uh, the, the wandering is the agitation, getting a bit, a bit excited, uh, entertaining ourselves. And the depression, uh, getting dull and also feeling quite low emotionally. So when we're with the effort, the tension of effort, uh, we, we have whatever our stamina is and then we blow out and then we get one of those two things. If we force our mind to concentrate after a while, we will get really tired. So we'll either get um, sleepy, uh, which is like coarse depression, um, or we might um, get subtle depression, which is where we have the, um, the object of meditation, but it's very dull. Everything slows down. Um, there's no clarity and there's no strength. Um, so this, we've got to really um, recognize the difference between going, getting dull, where we do actually relax a bit. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to relax and keep our mind alert and clear. And normally the only time we relax is when we go to sleep. So we've associated sleep and relaxation together until we think they're the same thing. So um, that's really dangerous for a meditator and for developing our mind. So then we kind of try and wake ourselves up. And how we normally do that is with agitation, with stimulation from outside. We'll get a new thing to look at or a new thing to hear and it'll wake us up. So again, we become reliant on, on the clarity and alertness by relying on distractions. So you can see where we've gone wrong, isn't it? <laughs> and we can be meditating away or you know, listening to something and think we're all focused, but then half an hour later, we're like, what? What happened? Where did my mind go? And we've been off entertaining ourselves with daydreams. Or you might find, say, you're reading a book and you've read a whole page and you can't remember what you read. So that one actually is more like the, the mental dullness. So when they say about um, developing our concentration, a really good example is say with driving, there's two, there's two forms, um, kind of a, 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 um, concentration, alertness and vigilance, depending which translation you use, but the two functions you'll get, which is part of you driving the car is focusing on the skill of driving. 
what's coming over there, looking in the mirror there, oh, you know, here comes a traffic island, whatever. So you're focused on that and you have to be focused on that. And then there's another part of your mind that's checking, have you fallen asleep or not? Are you getting drowsy or not? Both of those two modes are really important, aren't they? Because it's deadly, isn't it? If, if you don't have that um, alertness there to monitor how you're going, you can't tell if you're getting drowsy at the wheel. So when we're meditating, it's exactly the same. We're meditating on the topic and there's something in the back of our mind there that's monitoring. Are we getting really agitated and distracted? Are we getting a bit dull and falling asleep at the wheel? And also reminding ourselves to have a good posture, to relax, to have a break every 20 minutes, you know, all of those things to um, to sustain ourselves for the long term. So, you know, external driving, we've got that one down. That hopefully can become a transferable skill to internal, the process, the, the meditation driving. Then we've got a couple of other ones, not correcting the problems when they arise and over applying the antidotes. <laughs> I love these lists, you know, they cover everything, don't they? So the failure to correct problems is, um, you know, of course, if we notice, just like with driving, if we notice that we're getting a bit dull and depressed, we have to raise the game, tighten our concentration a bit. Um, if our mind is wandering around all agitated, we have to relax. So we've got to balance. If we find ourselves getting too tight, like Lama Yeshi famously said over and over again, don't squeeze your mind because he knew that by squeezing our mind and forcing ourselves, we will blow a gasket. So when that happens, when you notice that you're getting very tight and you've lost the joy in meditating or study, that's when you have to relax and actually Meditate on love and kindness, the support you receive from others, how much the Buddhas love you, how much that you wish all of your nearest and dearest to be happy, all of those things, um, the joyous thoughts. It's not a time to get heavy with yourself. So it's like um, washing, washing your internal thoughts, concentrating on happy thoughts is like bathing in happiness. Um, so that's if you get too tight. That's the antidote and you've got to correct it before you get into a bad habit of getting hard on yourself. Um, and the other one, of course, is if you are getting really, really drowsy, uh, instead of bathing yourself with happy thoughts, actually go and put cold water on your face. <laughs> it's really simple and it works a treat. So I like having an easy way to do things. So that's that helps us with an easy way. Um, so, you know, we might get those into play, correcting the problems when they arise. So, we've you know, we've done. Then we might overdo it. Number five, over applying the antidotes. So if you're an artist, you know what this one's about. It's like not knowing when to stop. You've done the piece and then you just keep fiddling and then you ruin it and you go, I should have stopped there. <laughs> so that's like over applying the antidotes. It means that we get a bit um, compulsive about obsessively looking for faults or problems or trying to finesse uh, our uh, practice too much. So what a joy to be able to actually get to that part where we actually have a nice, solid, stable practice. <laughs> so now, questions, comments. Who has one? Wave at me if you have a question or a comment about these, um, the, the obstacles and the antidotes. Anybody? No, it's clear enough. Okie dokie. Uh, well, let's do a little reflection just to give it a go, shall we? 
I have a nice um meditation. It's um it's not necessarily a Buddhist meditation, but it'll give us a, a taste of the different types of focus that we can develop. Uh, and I have a nice picture for it too. So here we go. <laughs> so this meditation, it's, um, we can set our motivation. It's to tame our minds. Why? So we can actually achieve the lasting happiness we so yearn for. And so we can bring the ultimate lasting happiness to everybody around us. You know, bring world peace and be able to lift all beings out of suffering and into lasting happiness. So with this motivation, we're going to just become aware of sounds, various sounds. So start just by... Um, bringing your focus to the sounds very close to you in the vicinity of say, if you, if you're wearing something like um, silk or uh, that when you move, there's a little bit of a sound of rustling uh, or if you've got some, um, you know, nice fluffy coat on or something like that, the, the sound of the, the material. There might be, a little bit of sound of things happening in the room. There might be a fan or the sound of the computer. So just become aware in that vicinity around you of the sound. And then shift your awareness out to the right to the edges of the room. Maybe there's a little insect there in the corner or a little mouse or a spider doing its web. Then maybe just to the outside of the house, there might be some leaves there blowing in the wind. There might be some activity going on in the garden. So even if you can't actually hear, you can shift your concentration to that area around your house and become aware of the space around your house and what's going on. Might be some bird sounds. There might be traffic going by. So don't follow the traffic down the road. Just be aware of when it comes into that vicinity and then it's gone again. Might be someone walking past. Just be aware when they're in that area, that vicinity. Don't keep following them, just become aware what's in that area. And as you do, you might become aware of the space within that area, the space where the sounds arise. And then Shift your focus, expand it a little bit more to become aware of the sounds in your neighborhood. So in the streets around you, the various different types of cars and trucks, the various different types of birds, maybe the sound of animals, the sound of the wind as it goes around various objects, the activities going on, various houses, different areas of the paddock. And then again, broaden your awareness to be aware of uh, the whole state that you're in, not just the neighborhood, but the whole city. Just become aware that it's there, that spaciousness. So all of it is existing simultaneously. The whole, the whole city within the state, within the country. And feel how as your focus expands, so does 
the spaciousness of your mind expand. Become aware of all of the space in between all of these objects. An expansive, relaxed overview. And then with your focus, you can tighten your attention to whatever area you decide. So we can slowly now bring our focus in, becoming aware of the outskirts of the city or the area. Shifting your focus to that, so the focus within the spaciousness. And again, back to your neighborhood. And then back again to just outside of your house or outside of the room. To just outside the edge of your body, the skin, your clothes. To the sounds within your body. Maybe your, your stomach, the sound of the breathing. There might be the sounds in your ears, the cicadas in your ears. And then to the mental sounds the ongoing conversations, the continuous chatter, the thoughts and feelings within your mind that we hear with our mind, not with our ears. But they're there all the time, aren't they? So again, become aware of those emotional sensations, those thoughts, those words, as objects within the mind, within that spaciousness of your experience. Not you, but arising within that spaciousness. So you don't have to squish them down, you don't have to make them go away. Just become aware of them as internal experiences arising and falling away within that spaciousness. You're not the emotion, you're not the distraction. So we can bring this reflection to a close by recognizing that just by looking at the nature of thoughts or sounds itself causes them to lose their power over us. And that we can actually identify with the spaciousness of our mind infinitely clear in which everything can arise and fall away. So dedicate your efforts to um, being able to bring forth, reveal that natural clarity and spaciousness. So how did everyone go with the meditation? <laughs> So was it um was it a, like a, a bit of a challenge or an effort or was it reasonably okay to do? Hands up if it was difficult. <laughs> um Sarah, did you have a, a, a comment or a question? 
Sarah, Sarah, oh, asked to unmute. Here we go. Go for it. <laughs> Just said, my mind is wandering right now. It's so hard to get it to stop. Um, yeah, that's right. My question is, but. Um, so part of it is, I think, if the momentum of our mind is wandering, it's like that elephant to at least get it into the vicinity of the topic. So wandering amongst the topic. And the only reason we'll be able to do that is if we know the benefits. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then we've got a we've got a um, a really deep incentive, an instinctual incent inst incentive to do it. So we've always got to start with the benefits, how this is going to benefit us, how it's actually going to help us feel happier, help us have a better life, help us help others, help us get out of cyclic existence and then do, do the work. <laughs> so that's why when they say about setting your motivation, I mean, it's really crucial to do it because we've got to feel good about trying. <laughs> Not like you should, but feel really looking forward to doing the practice. Then try and get into the vicinity. And um, I think it, it's like with a bicycle, you know, the first few pedals are really hard, but once you get started and you actually experience the benefits, you get your own momentum. Thank you. And yeah, th thank you. <laughs> So there are, there are different objects of meditation that we can use that are kind of, you know, maybe a little bit more fun than, than listening to sounds and whatever. But I thought that one was good because it gives you an idea of both the feeling of the expansiveness, how we can get a feeling of um, not just an overview, like looking down with our eyes, but feeling the entire area. So that's one form of relaxed kind of, concentration expansive concentration and then there's focus onto one thing and that's a different form of concentration so there are some uh, here we go some handy hints some practices that we can get started with so one of them physical solitude when we're trying to develop our concentration We've got to give ourselves a good chance. <laughs> so physical solitude free from distractions of social media, without the radio on in the background, without the phone next to you. Actually, all the studies say leave your phone in outside the room, not even in the same room, outside the room and close the door so that it, you physically cannot even like look over and check. Also, um, free from pets. Pets are a very nice distraction, but they're a distraction. So um, you can you can have the pets there to, to pep you up, to help you relax, but not when you're trying to do the meditation. Free from lists, those mental lists. So usually what happens is we sit down and we, we start to do whatever breathing or focus and we've cr we, in that little bit of mental space that we've created, all the things that we should be doing start popping up. <laughs> oh yeah, I've got to remember this. Oh yeah, I've got to remember that. Because finally we've made a little bit of space so they all bob to the surface. So that's number one distraction. <laughs> so what you can do to free yourself from that is have a notepad and paper and just write it down so that you can at least have the discipline. You don't have to be nagging, oh, I'm going to forget this important thing. You write it down and put it aside. Nice discipline like that. It's really good to do this in retreat too. Write it down and put it aside. Physical solitude also means being free of alcohol or drugs. So, you know, if you, if you tend to drowse off with meditation, don't have a big coffee and then sit down and meditate. <laughs> Actually, if you tend to get really drowsy meditation, have a nap, have a sleep first and then wake up, 20-minute nap, wash your face and then once you're actually rebooted. <laughs> so what we're trying to do is become free from all of these triggers that are either triggers for distraction or triggers for depression. 
and create a physical space that's really conducive. And um, so make it nice so that you're comfortable, um, so you don't get a sore bum, so that your back doesn't get sore. Um, but that nice balance between also putting a bit of effort into the posture means that, that your mind will become more alert as well. So this is where we start. Get the external right. Make it really a really nice place. And then mental solitude, free of rumination. <laughs> so just like physically, it's really hard to focus if, you know, we've got renovations going on next door. So it's really hard to focus if we have obsessions going on in our mind. And we have to free ourselves from those. Um, so rumination you know, the, the cracked record going over and over and over again um, until it becomes compulsive, automatic. So to free ourselves to create some mental solitude from this, uh, if we notice that we're already in that rumination, we're already been going around and around obsessing about something, either with resentment or with craving, uh, we've got to break the cycle. And so how you do that is by putting in a different object, just like distracting a baby. Once you've broken the cycle, then you can begin to um, develop some good mental habits, good mental hygiene. So um, part of the mental solitude is to put in new objects to obsess about. <laughs> Obsess about the three types of patients and how you're developing them or obsess about the, um, the, all the, the ways that anger and resentment harm us regardless of whether we're right or wrong. So, again, that's kind of like getting into the vicinity of the topic. Um, you might sit down to meditate and because you've created some space, then... Uh, all of those just kind of um, below the surface uh, preoccupations that we have come to the fore. So you sit down, you're really looking forward to a meditation, and then all of that stuff comes swimming back in again, the objects of lust or hatred. Uh, and we, it's kind of a bit like a daydreaming thing. And what happens is it's, we are, we're under their allure. We... We think about the, the objects of lust, the things that we love, whether it's a person or cheesecake or whatever it is, and it's kind of nice thinking about them. So we are lured by it. Or that we're under the allure of um, our objects of resentment. Well, oh, they did this and they did that and that's not right and la, 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 la. And uh, we're kind of charmed by those things. So we need to have a strategy what to do, what to think about when we sit down, how to set our mind well. And as Lama Zerapimbache says, the real holiday, the real holiday is the mind free of delusion, free of craving, free of hatred, <laughs> free of obsession, free of worry. That's the holiday. So whenever we crave a holiday, which is why I put that picture there, actually what we're craving is mental peace, mental solitude, and we think it's out there in the holiday. As we know, we can go on holiday, but if we don't create some mental solitude, we'll just come back even more exhausted, won't we? So the best way to have a holiday is to actually have a rest, to go on holiday, go to the beach, have a nice time, rejuvenate and rest and then whilst you're still on holiday in these perfect conditions, then turn your mind to meditation. Then actually put some effort into focusing when you're in optimal conditions. You're in a controlled environment. It's in your own time. But we don't normally do that. We go on a holiday and we just blame out till we're kind of like mentally dull or we distract ourselves, completely waste the benefit of a holiday. Then we get back to our life and we're like, oh, no, what do I do? How do I deal with this? And we get all stressed and whatever. And that's when you're stressed, that's 
not the time to try and develop your concentration. <laughs> it's too late. So, oh, poor humans, don't we get it just round back to front? So have a, have a holiday and then make sure it's a real holiday, a holiday from the delusions. Choose a virtuous object of meditation to focus on. So, you know, not not just sound like we did, but a virtuous object, something that it's worth us putting that effort into. Start with developing kindness. Kindness is a virtuous object. And kindness, a sense of kindness towards everybody, those who we like, those who we may not necessarily want to cuddle, like frogs and crocodiles, all the way to those we dislike who actually need kindness the most. Or we can focus our mind on an object of meditation that's kind of really creative. So um, I have an image of a Buddha that I'll put up in a moment as well uh, because the image of a Buddha is a way of actually uh, focusing on all the qualities of enlightenment without it being boring dot points like this, but something that really uh, ignites your senses, uses the creativity of the senses. Avoid the allure of laxity or excitement. Notice it for what it is. <laughs> you know, they both flirt with us. Sleepiness, you know, it flirts with us. Oh, come on, just, just, just close your eyes for a moment. It'd be so nice. <laughs> and, and excitement, it flirts with us by going, oh, isn't this interesting? And anticipation and la, 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 and off we go. So just set them aside. You know, tell yourself, yeah, sure, but think about it later. Do that later. Also recognise that um, multitasking is a form of um, agitation. It's actually when we multitask, try and do this and this and this all at the same time, we might think we're being efficient. But actually what we're doing, it's attention capture. We're relying on our distraction to keep us going. So it's not sustainable and it will mean that when it comes time to focus on one thing like solving a problem, we won't be able to do it. We'll focus for two seconds and off we go. And as we're developing our meditation practice, we really want to um, focus on the quality, not the amount of time. So stick to, say, 10 minutes, maybe 15 or 20 if you if you you know more um, more advanced I suppose uh, but 10 minutes and then just get better at the quality of it so just like with driving don't just drive for longer and longer hours just get better at driving <laughs> so um because what can happen if you just keep extending the length of time the quality won't get better so you want to just get better at being able to sit down and, fo and and set your motivation and focus that takes less and less time so you get it get a, a really nice um flow happening then be able to do the focus and then dedicate at the end and then that becomes so habitual and so easy that you can easily sustain the whole thing from start to finish for 10 minutes um, without getting up tight so quality over quantity. So an object of meditation that's virtuous. The images of enlightenment are so helpful to us because they are a lot more than an image. They tell a story. The image of the Buddha tells the story of how to get enlightened. Everything's in it. Well, everything's in this except the throne <laughs> in this image. I should have put the throne in too, but it's hard to fit it into a landscape size picture. Um, so when you, when you look at the image of the Buddha, not only is it nice for the senses, but it also engages us intellectually and then we can become familiar with the qualities of enlightenment. So, for instance, this course, the Triple Decker on the Three Higher Trainings, so they are represented by the Buddha's robes three types of robes and and what do what do robes or clothes do they protect us they protect us from the elements the three higher trainings 
protect us from everything that comes at us in life. Um, it's They have pockets. <laughs> That's where we carry our stuff. Uh, it's how we keep ourselves nice and it beautifies us. So, you know, as you're gazing at the robes of the Buddha and all the gold offered to the, to the Buddha, you know, on the robes and things, you can be thinking about the three higher trainings and how useful they are how they, you know, the ethics, you know, how it holds us up, our core strength. It's really nice. So it's a form of divine advertising. <laughs> you know, we know advertising works. So let's use advertising for the power of good rather than the power of evil. <laughs> the image of the Buddha, it's a map of meaning. The whole meaning is there and it's such a nice way to engage in it. And I love this image in particular because, you know, there's the sea of samsara behind and then this, you know, the, the calm aura of, of the Buddha enlightenment, how it transforms it. Also, because it's enlightenment personified, it's a way of relating to these qualities, how it means something to us in the form of a person. So we start developing an intimate relationship with the Buddha, the Buddha who loves you more than you love yourself who cares for you more than you care for yourself, who knows everything about you and loves you anyway. I mean, how amazing is that? And how, ma how many of us have that as a relationship? And we can have that relationship with the Buddha. So by doing this meditation on an image of a Buddha, we get this powerful biofeedback. We start developing this relationship, a healthy relationship, that keeps on giving. And then this amazing thing happens. Because <laughs> when we meditate on the image of a Buddha, we think of it as a mirror. That Buddha out there, that is a mirror of your potential. It's not me here and Buddha there, that is a mirror. The whole experience is happening in your mind, right? <laughs> but we're so alienated from our potential. How do we get back to it? How do we reconnect with our potential? Is by meditating on an image of a Buddha until we become so familiar that we start actually recognizing when we look in the mirror, we don't see the faults, we don't see the limitations. We see, who am I really? I am a potential Buddha and nothing less. So that can become a really genuine experience through meditation. And instead of looking in the mirror and, you know, getting all despondent, <laughs> you can look in the mirror and you can admire your virtues. You can enhance your virtues. So uh, concentration, you know, the two strong arms that hold our wisdom. It's always got to be informed by love, an altruistic or higher purpose. It's not just uh, generic concentration. And if we have that concentration, if we develop concentration, it means we'll be able to use our Dharma wisdom. When problems come, we will be able to access our Dharma wisdom. Whereas normally when problems come, we just forget everything, don't we, in panic. <laughs> but with concentration, it means we will be able to literally hold on and we'll be able to access our Dharma wisdom. Instead of getting angry, we'll remember how to practice patience. Or instead of getting fearful, we'll remember they're more scared than we are. We'll know what to do. We'll be able to actually make a good decision. Concentration is the opposite of attention capture. So most of our day-to-day -day is attention capture, dominated by the senses here, there, and everywhere. So concentration is complete opposite of that. And um, remember, meditating on the Buddha, it's a mirror of your potential what you can, you know, your natural birthright. So um, I think 
we've come to the end of our time. Is there any um, quick comment or question? Oh, there's the other Mary smiling away. <laughs> Does anyone have um, anything that needs clarifying or um, a question? All okay. So, so your homework, folks, is to to enjoy a meditation on the Buddha. <laughs> so I'm sure, or on any of the Buddhas, will do. I'm sure um, Tupta Norbu Ling has many meditations that you can access. And when you do, remember the benefits. Remember to enjoy it. And then remember, it's a mirror of your potential. So, so at least aim to do that at least one this week before we come back for next week, which is on, um, on wisdom. Uh, so thank you so much. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much. <laughs> thank 